Hello, good evening, and welcome everybody here to the Rothenberg Hall here at Huntington. Uh, as you know, we are celebrating our centennial this year. I'm delighted to see uh, so many of you here to help us celebrate. My name is Steve Hindle. I'm Director of Research here at the Huntington, where I look after the conference program, the fellowship program, and the lecture program. So uh, it is 100 years since Henry and Arabella Huntington signed the deed of indenture which turned their private collection into a public research institute. And we have a whole series of events and programs this year that are designed to commemorate that uh, wonderful act of philanthropy. Uh, the central platform of it for the research division is a series of centennial lectures. This is the third one in the series, and the principle that motivates them is to have a scholar who has earned a distinguished reputation in his or her particular field to revisit their work on one of the treasures of our collections, to interrogate the provenance of that material, to explain how it came to be at the Huntington, and to explain its relevance for an early 21st century audience. One of our lecture endowments supports a program of this kind in literature. It's named in honor of my predecessor but one as director of research, Martin Ridge, um, was established in 1992. Martin was a very distinguished historian of the American West, but he insisted that the gift in his honor be used to support a program in literature. And we must all, I think, be thankful for that act of intellectual generosity. Previous lecturers in the series have included Paul Theroux, Dame Hilary Mantel, Sir Jonathan Bate, David Castan, and Jim Shapiro. Delighted this evening to uh, welcome Zachary Lesser from the University of Pennsylvania, who was the first of the centennial lecturers to um, accept my invitation to speak. I think the interval between email and response was slightly less than three minutes. Um, and that speaks very well of his enthusiasm for what we were trying to accomplish here. So let me welcome him and introduce him. Zach Lesser is Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's taught since 2006. He holds his BA from Brown and his PhD from Columbia. He was Assistant Professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before moving to Philadelphia. He's held fellowships from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and for the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. He's the author of Renaissance Drama and the Politics of Publication, Readings in the English Book Trade, which appeared in 2004, and Hamlet After Q1, An Uncanny History of the Shakespearean Text, which appeared in 2014 and is the reason that he is here this evening. Both volumes, both of those books, were awarded the Elizabeth Dietz Award offered by Rice University in conjunction with the journal Studies in English Literature for the best book published in that year in the field of English Renaissance Studies. He's also editor of the book in Britain, A Historical Introduction, co-editor of Textual Conversations in the Renaissance and of the book in History, the book as History, New Intersections of the Material Text to discuss the bad quarto, one of our treasures, Hamlet and other ghost stories, please welcome the Huntington Centennial Ridge lecturer, Zach Lesser. Thank you very much, and thank you, Steve, for that introduction and, and for the invitation. I accept it very quickly because there's no way I could say no. Um, it, it's a great honor to give this centennial lecture at one of my favorite places in the world, and even more so because I get to talk to you tonight about my favorite book in the world, one that I spent five years of my life pondering, the Huntington Library's copy of the first quarto of Hamlet. This edition of the play is sometimes called the bad quarto, for reasons I'll explain. But I don't call it that because I think it's very good and I wouldn't want to hurt its feelings. In fact, <clears throat> I think it's the best quarto. So I'll call it Q1 Hamlet, or just Q1 for short. And I was working on this book, in fact, all during the run-up to the big celebration in 2016 of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. <clears throat> 
The Folger Shakespeare Library commemorated that date by sending copies of the first folio to all 50 states. And just briefly, the words quarto and folio just are terms for two different book formats um, that describe the way the printed sheets that came off the press were folded in order to produce the book. Um, Shakespeare's plays were generally published individually in quarto, and then they were collected in the more grand, imposing folio format. Well, it's understandable, of course, that we would celebrate Shakespeare by celebrating his first collected works, published in 1623, seven years after he died. This first complete Shakespeare is probably the most highly prized book in the English language. And the Folger Shakespeare Library has 82 copies of it, more than enough to go around. <clears throat> copies of the first folio have recently sold at auction for two to three million dollars. But as you can see already, it's not a particularly rare book. The Huntington has four of their own, and my own University of Pennsylvania has two, although one of them currently looks like this. <clears throat> the other one looks much better. This pile of ashes once belonged to the great 19th century American actor Edwin Forrest. When his house caught fire, he ordered his servants to save the folio even at the cost of their own lives. Now they clearly didn't think much of that command. <clears throat> The fact that Forrest then carefully placed the ashes into this glass case and that the university carefully preserves those remains to this day shows us just how powerful the first folio is in our culture. The book is valuable even when it cannot serve the main function of a book to be read. We can stand near it, we can touch this reliquary and receive some sort of blessing from our secular literary saint. The Huntington copy of the, first folio, of the first quarto of Hamlet, by contrast, is a far humbler object. It probably retailed for about six pence when it was published in 1603. The first folio cost about 40 times as much. And it would have been sold not bound like it is now, but rather as an unbound pamphlet, its pages roughly stabbed three or four times with an awl and held together with a bit of string, the Renaissance version of stapling. The Huntington Q1 has been heavily trimmed over the years, and it's missing the last page entirely. Here on the left-hand side, you can see the final original page of the book, and on the right, the last page has been supplied much later in a facsimile copy. And yet, ordinary as the Huntington Q1 looks, it's one of the most valuable books in the world. If it ever came up for auction, don't worry, it never will, uh, it would sell for far more than any copy of the first folio. We can have no precise idea of its worth because no copy has been sold for about 175 years. And no such sale will happen again, since only two copies exist, this one and one at the British Library. It is therefore quite literally priceless. <clears throat> Why did I become so obsessed with this book? It's not a beautiful book, like the Ellesmere Manuscript of the Canterbury Tales or Audubon's Birds of America, to pick two treasures at the Huntington. It's not an authorial manuscript like Ben Franklin's autobiography, since we have no Shakespeare manuscripts, except perhaps three pages of a collaboratively written play called Sir Thomas More, now at the British Library. In fact, there's really nothing unusual at all about the first quarto of Hamlet. It looks pretty much like every other play published during Shakespeare's lifetime. The fascination of this book for me has everything to do with its provenance that is, with the winding path it has taken over the centuries to where it resides today. The most important thing about this book is that it was completely lost for two centuries after Shakespeare's death. This is a ghost story. What happens when a book that seemed lost forever suddenly reappears to haunt the living? There was a Hamlet before Hamlet a version of the play that is at times strikingly different from the one we know. For 200 years now, critics have debated exactly what to make of this other Hamlet and how to reconcile it with the more familiar version of the play. The story begins in the small village of Great Barton in the southeast of England. The year is 1823, and Sir Henry Bunbury has recently inherited Barton Hall, the manor house of the village, from his father. 
While inventorying his new possessions, Bunbury found a book in one of the closets, which he described as a small quarto, barbarously cropped and very ill bound. The book bound together 12 of Shakespeare's plays, nearly all in their first editions, all valuable, but familiar enough at the time. But Bunbury soon realized he'd found something more unusual. A copy of Hamlet published a year prior to the earliest text of the play then known, and at that time, the only copy thought to exist. <clears throat> it was recognizably Hamlet, but it was radically different from the play that was already the most revered work of English literature. Bunbury surmised that the volume had been purchased by his grandfather, Sir William Bunbury, who, he tells us, was an ardent collector of old dramas. If so, one wonders how such a collector could have missed the incredible rarity in this group. But Sir William seems to have had no idea what he had on his hands. He drew no special attention to the book, and it lay quietly on that shelf in Barton Hall for two more generations. Sir Henry himself, like his grandfather, does not seem to have valued the book highly enough. He exchanged it with the booksellers Payne and Foss for 180 pounds worth of books. But Payne and Foss quickly turned it around and sold it at a tidy profit to William Cavendish, the Duke of Devonshire. <clears throat> we see this pattern repeatedly in the history of Q1 Hamlet. It is misrecognized, misunderstood, and oddly undervalued. 30 years later, in 1856, the Dublin bookseller M.W. Rooney was approached by a student at Trinity College who wanted to sell an old playbook that was missing its title page. The student had shopped it around to several booksellers, but no one was interested in the beat-up old pamphlet. Without the title page, the student and these booksellers would have actually had to read the play to discover it was a second copy of Q1, and apparently they never did, thereby demonstrating in very real financial terms the perils of not reading your Shakespeare. <laughs> <clears throat> Rooney bought it at the bargain basement price of one shilling. It's only, it only two times what it probably sold for in 1603. <clears throat> he then offered it to the scholar and collector James Hallowell Phillips for 100 pounds, adding that if he did not give me that sum, I would try the British Museum. Hallowell correctly predicted that the museum would never buy an imperfect book at Rooney's asking price, and he countered with considerably less. Rooney refused and ultimately sold the copy to some booksellers for 70 pounds, still a tidy 139,900% markup. These booksellers then turned around and sold the book to none other than Hallowell Phillips, who by this point had seen his error, much to Rooney's delight. And finally, the British Museum bought the book from Hallowell, again at a highly inflated price. That copy remains at the British Library today. Meanwhile, the first copy discovered, Bunbury's copy, stayed in the library of Chatsworth House, the family seat of the Dukes of Devonshire for another century. Unfortunately, while it was there, it was disbound. The pages of each play barbarously cropped once again to be inlaid in fine paper and rebound into new volumes containing six to eight plays, the way the Duke liked to keep his collection of drama. We therefore can only surmise what the book that Bunbury found in his closet looked like. In 1914, Henry Huntington acquired the Devonshire collection of plays a sale made necessary by what Publishers Weekly called the heavy burden of death duties. In other words, the introduction of the first comprehensive estate tax in England. When the eighth duke died in 1908, the ninth duke found himself with half a million pounds in taxes due. So Huntington's purchase of a good portion, portion of the Devonshire Library for $750,000 came in very handy. Publishers Weekly singled out the Q1 Hamlet as the most valuable single book in the world at that time, exceeding the copy of the Gutenberg Bible, for which Huntington had earlier paid the then record price of $50,000. Finally, in 1920, Huntington had his bookbinder take apart some of the Devonshire play volumes, the ones with the gems of the collection, and individually bind the plays they contained. Only then did this copy of Q1 Hamlet reach its current state, appearing more or less as it does now. Only then, did it finally stand on its own, a hundred years after its rediscovery? Now we might say the true importance of Q1 Hamlet was finally being grasped. 
<clears throat> Why did people have such difficulty in understanding the worth of this book when it emerged from the purgatory of that closet in Great Barton? The answer has everything to do with its complete disappearance from history between the early 1600s and 1823, the very period in which Hamlet was being canonized as the most important work of English literature. The Hamlet we all know, and the only Hamlet anyone knew until the discovery of Q1, is actually a combination of two other early editions. The second quarto published in 1604, and the text from the first folio of 1623. This is a common pattern since about half of Shakespeare's plays were first published in a quarto edition during his lifetime and then collected into the first folio. The two texts of these plays are never identical, as you can see here in a famous line from Romeo and Juliet. In these cases of variation, it's often impossible to determine whether Shakespeare actually wrote one word or the other, or first one and then the other, or perhaps neither. Since the 18th century, Editors have combined the second quarto and folio texts of Hamlet and created our modern version of the play. While these two texts differ in a number of lines, the second quarto may derive from Shakespeare's manuscript, while the folio text seems to have been lightly altered in getting the play ready for the stage. Nonetheless, they're fundamentally the same. The text contained in Q1, on the other hand, is far stranger. And when Bunbury made his discovery, readers suddenly had to confront this bizarre alternate Hamlet, which claimed to be by William Shakespeare, but sounded at times rather un-Shakespearean. Q1's absence from the conversation during the intervening years meant that its text was hard to assimilate. Famous lines were missing or completely different. Characters' names were changed. The plot was familiar and yet not precisely the same. Here, for instance, as I'll show you in a moment, the to be or not to be soliloquy is diametrically opposed to the famous and familiar one. And Hamlet's dying words are not the enigmatic, the rest is silence. Instead, this Hamlet says devoutly, heaven receive my soul. In Q1, Gertrude explicitly denies any knowledge of the murder and vows to help her son to revenge. She and Horatio then team up to conspire against Claudius. I'm going to talk more about what's in Q1 in a moment, but I want to linger a bit on its miraculous discovery after it had hidden unknown for so many years in that closet. As I've mentioned, Bunbury's copy is missing the last page. The text, therefore, breaks off in a way that I think perfectly symbolizes this strangely recovered play. Hamlet speaks his final line, and then we get the stage direction, Ham dies, followed by an incongruous enter, as what's called the catchword, which gives the first word of the next page to help the printer assemble the sheets in the correct order. But we don't know who enters or what they do when they enter. <clears throat> this play about a haunting, which had itself just returned from oblivion, concludes on a mysterious ghostly entrance. By contrast, as we've seen, the second copy of Q1 includes the missing final page, but lacks the title page. There's nothing too interesting, actually, about who enters. <clears throat> it's an odd coincidence, then, that we have only two copies, and neither is complete. Both are needed to make the whole, which only adds to the sense of happenstance and luck that we have this text at all. It might easily have been lost forever. And for me, this is a powerful and haunting reminder of the precarious nature of our historical and literary record and of the need to protect it for the future. That is the important work of libraries like the Huntington, of course. But no matter how much we are able to preserve, our understanding of Shakespeare, and indeed of most early authors, always depends on the vagaries of historical survival. For example, the records of Philip Henslow, who ran the Rose Theater while Shakespeare's troupe was performing nearby at the Globe, reveal that of all the plays performed at the Rose, only about one in seven survive. More than 80% of the plays performed at this crucial moment in Shakespeare's development as a dramatist, the plays he saw, admired, or hated, and may even have helped to write, are completely lost, except for their suggestive titles in Henslow's account books, plays like Strange News Out of Poland, or Crack Me This Nut, or, or the blind man eats many a fly. <laughs> Who knows what these plays were about? 
<clears throat> From this scattered record, we create our narratives of history. Narratives that might be very different if chance had kept some things hidden and discovered others. When Q1 emerged from that closet, people soon recognized that it had the power to transform how we think about Shakespeare, about how he worked as a dramatist, and about the meaning of his most renowned play. For instance, in the diary of a member of parliament, printed in a literary newspaper, the politician says, with a wonderfully over-the-top comment, that if this new Hamlet was truly written by Shakespeare, it would be the most interesting and instructive subject of philosophical inquiry in the annals of in intellect. Now to take one example of why the question seems so important. Readers had long debated the extent to which Queen Gertrude was complicit in the murder of Hamlet's father. Had she been carrying on an affair with Claudius beforehand? Had she helped to plan the crime? Well, in Q1, the Queen clears this all up, swearing to Hamlet that she knew nothing of the murder, and then pledging to conceal, consent, and do my best, what stratagem soe'er thou shalt devise, while offering a thousand mother's blessings to my son. In newspaper and magazine articles published after the, the discovery of Q1, you can almost hear Victorian readers breathing a sigh of relief at this proof of womanly virtue. <clears throat> Q1 gave Victorians the Gertrude they wanted. But this only made it more important to discover exactly how the version in Q1 related to the version they already knew and loved so well. Had Q1 been discovered even 50 years earlier, things would have been very different. Because by the early 19th century, the Romantic movement had declared Hamlet the pinnacle of literary achievement. Earlier in the 18th century, for instance, Samuel Johnson had seen plenty of problems with the play. Hamlet is, through the whole play, rather an instrument than an agent. The catastrophe is not very happily produced. The poet is accused of having shown little regard to poetical justice and may be charged with equal neglect of poetical probability. <clears throat> that was one of the Shakespeare plays he actually liked. <clears throat> Notice that Johnson is concerned mainly with the structure of the play as a whole, how the plot is built, whether it conforms to the classical rules of tragedy. For Coleridge, by contrast, Hamlet, the character, was the center of attention. We see a great, almost enormous intellectual activity and a proportionate aversion to real action consequent upon it. I have a smack of Hamlet myself, if I may say so. <laughs> For the Romantics, the play Hamlet was almost entirely about the mind of Hamlet, the hypersensitive, self-reflective mind, thinking almost as obsessively about thinking that is taken to characterize modernity. This is a powerful reading of Hamlet, one that's very much still with us, and one that has as its centerpiece the to be or not to be soliloquy. But it's not at all the Hamlet of Q1, as we'll see. And so it became crucial to figure out exactly how this Hamlet came into existence and to determine whether it had really been written by Shakespeare. Two theories dominated. The first followed the conventional wisdom in the 18th century that Shakespeare hab habitually revised, and that those other plays with two different texts, such as Romeo and Juliet or King Lear, represented Shakespeare's first drafts and then his final revision. When Q1 was reprinted in 1825, this was how the booksellers Payne and Foss introduced it to the public. The present edition of Hamlet is an accurate reprint from the only known copy of the tragedy as originally written by Shakespeare, which he afterwards altered and enlarged. But precisely because of Q1's belated rediscovery, the rough draft theory was soon eclipsed by a novel and more radical theory. For the Romantics, great poetry, and therefore Hamlet above all, resulted from a single inspired act of original creation what Wordsworth called the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, rather than from the patient drudgery of revision. And so an alternate theory was developed, which would come to dominate Shakespeare's studies until very recently. According to this theory, there was no other version of Shakespeare's Hamlet at all. Shakespeare wrote only the famous version of the play. Since it was popular, however, it was stolen and published in a garbled, deformed text a bootleg copy, a bad quarto. Perhaps someone tried to transcribe the play in shorthand as it was being performed, or perhaps it was badly reconstructed from memory by a minor actor trying to earn a few extra pounds. 
This minor actor is usually thought to be Marcellus, since his lines resemble those in the familiar text more than anyone else's. That there are indeed parts of the text of Q1 Hamlet that seem plausibly to result from faulty memory. In the text as we know it, at one point, Rosencrantz asks Hamlet, what is the cause of your distemper? But in Q1, some version of this line seems to appear no less than four times. First, Claudius asks the two to wring from him the cause and ground of his distemperancy. Then Rosencrantz asks Hamlet to tell him the cause and ground of your discontent. Later, Polonius, inexplicably called Carambus in Q1, says that he cannot yet find out the very ground of his distemperance. And finally, Rosencrantz, let us again entreat to know of you the ground and cause of your distemperature. You could see how this might happen. The minor actor remembered a line about the cause of your distemper, or was it the cause and ground of your distemper, and tried to place it where it belonged. But the line got stuck in his head, and he used it wherever it seemed to fit. <clears throat> But other parts of Q1 seem hard to explain on this theory. For instance, the text contains an entire scene between the queen and Horatio in which the two team up against Claudius that has no parallel at all in the familiar play. It's not easy to see how this scene might have been created by an actor trying to remember the famous version of the play. Likewise, if Q1 simply resulted from bad memory or bad stenography, we would expect it to look fairly haphazard in the way it misremembers Hamlet. And yet, some differences from the familiar version are quite consistent. Most important among these, as I'll discuss in a moment, are several changes that make the play and the character of Hamlet far more piously Christian. While the rough draft and the memorial reconstruction theories were opposed throughout the 19th century and still today, in fact, they share a fundamental characteristic both allow us to forget a very inconvenient fact about Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's a remake. There was a Hamlet on the London stages before Shakespeare seems to have begun his career. Scholars call this earlier play the Ur Hamlet, Ur meaning original or primitive in German. <clears throat> the play is now lost, and we know of it only from allusions. One of these allusions gives us the only line that survives from this mysterious play. We're told that the ghost cries out, Hamlet, revenge, a line that does not appear in any of the texts we have. If, in fact, this is a line from the play at all. After all, the most famous line in Casablanca, play it against Sam, is never actually spoken in the movie. Here we have another ghost of Hamlet. The idea that there was a Hamlet before Hamlet has long haunted Shakespearean critics. If the play predates Shakespeare, just how Shakespearean is it? What if this Ur Hamlet looked more like Shakespeare's play than we have generally been willing to admit? Each of the two opposed theories of Q1, rough draft or garbled reconstruction, allowed 19th century readers to evade this question. According to both, Shakespeare's Hamlet is a fully original creation of the author's genius, as romantic theory held that it must be. Either Q1 was Shakespeare's own first version of the play, or there was only ever one version at all, mangled in Q1 by the unskilled stenographer or actor. Both theories effectively re-quarantine the Ur Hamlet and Q1 so that they cannot contaminate Shakespeare's poetic genius. This attempt to distinguish Shakespeare's Hamlet from the mysterious version that appeared in Sir Henry Bunbury's closet and to cut off Shakespeare's play from any predecessor has had profound effects on our understanding of this most famous work of English literature. Some of what we simply take for granted about the play, in fact, derives from Bunbury's unexpected find. In my book, Hamlet After Q1, I detail a number of these bits of common wisdom, which circulate in theater programs, in high school and college classrooms, and around the internet. Indeed, I've passed along all of them to my own students at one time or another. But when we understand how these conventional assumptions became conventional only thanks to Bunbury's belated discovery, it turns out they aren't quite right. So I apologize to my former students for that. <clears throat> the larger point is that even if you've never heard before of Q1 Hamlet, it has probably been quietly influencing your understanding of the play. So in the rest of my talk, I want to take a look at one example of this, which involves the key line in the most famous passage in English lit, to be or not to be. The line is, thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And the question is, what does Hamlet mean by conscience? 
But to be or not to be soliloquy is so well known that it's lost much of its power to sur surprise us, but actually it's very strange, not least because it completely refuses to do what a soliloquy is supposed to do, tell us about the inner thoughts of a character. In this speech, there is no character. Hamlet never uses the first person pronoun, never says I. The speech is entirely abstract. This abstraction is part of Hamlet's consistent refusal of selfhood under the pressure of the task the ghost has laid on him. In his first soliloquy, he longs for his flesh to melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Later, he wishes he were an actor, dissolving the self into a scripted role. And here in To Be or Not To Be, he dissolves the self into intellectual abstraction. But this abstraction also results from the form of the speech. Hamlet has recently come home from university, and this speech is, in fact, a school exercise, the kind of thesis Hamlet would have written to practice logic and rhetoric. Such theses explicitly had to be composed in the abstract, without reference to one's own life. In surviving university exams from Shakespeare's day, as in modern debate classes, students must argue first the pro side of a question and then the con. One common test question was, is it better to be unhappy or not to be at all? A version of Hamlet's own question. It's therefore not surprising that Hamlet's speech is organized according to a rigorous binary logic that mirrors university training in debate, pro and con, and that begins with a statement of the question, to be or not to be, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. But this binary logic consistently breaks down because what Hamlet has seen and heard cannot be easily accommodated in an either or approach. To die, to sleep, no more, Hamlet says, before correcting himself. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Either death is nothing else but sleeping, unconsciousness, or death, like sleeping, may involve some other form of consciousness, dreaming. And here, uncertainty sets in. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Again, Hamlet divides the question into two options. Should we bear those ills we have here on earth or fly to others that we know not of after death? This is an either or that Hamlet cannot resolve because of the impossibility of knowing what happens after death. And it leads to his conclusion. It's this dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, that puzzles the will and prevents us from acting at all. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. But notice that Hamlet's conclusion is a very strange thing for him to say, something he could say only if he abstracts himself in this paradoxically impersonal soliloquy. No traveler returns from the undiscovered country? Hamlet has just seen this firsthand. His father has come back from the dead as a ghost. Hamlet should know that death is not mere unconsciousness. His university logic is not serving him very well here. The famous existential skepticism of this speech comes at the expense of Hamlet's personal history of his identity. It also comes at the expense of his faith. Hamlet is a Christian after all. He ought to know, therefore, that there's another man who famously returned from the undiscovered country. Hamlet's entire soliloquy is premised on his forgetting of Christ. The radical skepticism of this speech overthrows all authority, whether that of Hamlet's own father or of God the Father. An important part of this skepticism has been the recurrent critical interpretation of the key line, thus conscience does make cowards of us all. We're usually told that here, conscience does not have its common moral religious meaning, but rather means something like consciousness or self-reflection, or as in this comment on answers.com, carefully thinking things through. Thought itself, self-conscious reflection on the possible results of action prevents us from acting at all. This idea is ubiquitous in editorial glossing, in classroom lectures, and in recent popular critical works like Stephen Greenblatt's Hamlet in Purgatory and Jonathan Bates' The Genius of Shakespeare. But in fact, this version of Hamlet's conscience belongs far more to the 19th century after Bunbury's discovery than it does to Shakespeare's 17th century. 
As soon as Q1 was reprinted in 1825, its rendering of to be or not to be provided an easy target for ridicule. The passage reads like a retranslation from the French, according to one reviewer. It's filled with unconnected, in, unintelligible jargon. Its absurdity surpasses that of intentional burlesque. And yet, the speech is not actually such a monstrosity of nonsense. With some creative editing and punctuating, the sort of work that by 1823 had already been done on all other Shakespearean texts, the soliloquy makes good enough sense. Like the familiar version, Q1 to be or not to be follows a powerful binary logic, but this same form leads to a precisely opposite understanding of the relationship between this world and the next. <clears throat> to be or not to be, aye, there's the point. To die, to sleep, is that all? Aye, all, no. To sleep, to dream, aye, Mary, there it goes. For in that dream of death, when we awake, and born before an everlasting judge, from whence no passenger ever returned, the undiscovered country at whose sight the happy smile and the accursed damned. But for this, the joyful hope of this, who'd bear the scorns and flattery of the world, scorned by the right rich, the rich cursed of the poor, the widow being oppressed, the orphan wronged, the taste of hunger or tyrant's reign, and thousand more calamities besides, to grunt and sweat under this weary life, when that he may his full quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would this endure but for a hope of something after death? Which puzzles the brain and doth confound the sense, which makes us rather bear those evils we have than fly to others that we know not of. Aye, that, oh, this conscience makes cowards of us all. Here too, Hamlet begins with the question, or the point, of being and non-being. Here too, he imagines death as a kind of sleep before correcting himself by positing the existence of dreams after death. But now the two versions diverge. It's not the fear of bad dreams that worries this Hamlet. Instead, death itself is the dream, that dream of death, from which we will surely awaken, when we awake, Hamlet says, and that when signals his certain faith. This is not the theology of the familiar to be or not to be, but rather of John Donne's great poem, Death Be Not Proud, which concludes, one short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Death is merely temporary, a short sleep or a dream, for Christ has conquered death and returned to tell us the good news. Hamlet's faith leads him naturally to the scene of divine judgment. It's the joyful hope, not the dread of something after death, that gives us the strength to endure this life of suffering. In Q1, what puzzles the brain and makes us rather bear these evils we have than fly to others that we know not of is the fear of the last judgment when we may be among the accursed who are damned. The sin of suicide condemns us to an eternity of incomprehensible torment in hell, and so instead we bear those evils we have in the joyful hope of being among the happy who will smile at doomsday. Thus Christian conscience stays our hands. Q1's version of to be or not to be presents a powerfully coherent Protestant vision focused on what were often called the four final things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Had Q1 never been lost, would its soliloquy have seemed like unconnected, unintelligible jargon? It was not any inherent obscurity in the Q1 speech that made it seem like parody or burlesque, I think, but rather its reemergence only after the more familiar text had long been entrenched at the peak of the literary canon. And despite the scorn heaped upon Q1's version, its sudden appearance completely transformed to be or not, how to be or not to be was understood in its famous version. Before Bunbury's discovery, no one ever seems to have imagined that conscience might mean anything other than our innate ability given by God to discern good from evil. Afterward, however, Numerous editors and critics began to insist that conscience must not be understood in this familiar sense. To do so would be naive, resulting, as A.C. Bradley wrote in the period's most influential critical work, in the total misinterpretation of the line. Rather, we're told, conscience here means reflection on the consequences of action. And this idea proliferated across virtually every edition of the play. The Pitt Press Shakespeare for Schools edition, for instance, told high schoolers emphatically that conscience meant speculative reflection, 
from the sense consciousness, not the moral sense, as at 5, 2, 58, 67. These added cross-references to Hamlet's remarks about killing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, they're not near my conscience, and Claudius, it's not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm, are striking. Even though Shakespeare uses the word elsewhere in this very play, in the moral sense, this edition is adamant that it cannot have this meaning in to be or not to be. But why not? What led to this insistence? The choice of meaning has major implications for the famous version of the speech. If conscience means the divinely implanted moral judge, then the soliloquy, at least at this moment, carries a strongly religious message. But if conscience means consciousness or speculation, then the soliloquy lacks any overt religious discourse and will be more easily understood as a skeptical interrogation of the nature and even the existence of the afterlife. The adoption of the new reading of this line thus involves the largest issues of to be or not to be and of Hamlet as a whole. This new reading was driven by the discovery of Q1 and by a new theory of its origins. The key moment came in 1872 in an Oxford Shakespeare edition of Hamlet. The editors presented their solution tentatively, but it was ultimately to transform understandings of Hamlet and Shakespeare for generations. Q1 offers us a glimpse of the mysterious Ur Hamlet, they wrote, in a transition state, while it was undergoing a remodeling, but had not received more than the first rough touches of the great master's hand. The editors thus rejected the quarantining of the earlier non-Shakespearean play that both sides in the debate between the rough draft and bootleg copy theories had enforced. <clears throat> With Q1 now seen as a transition state between the Ur Hamlet and Shakespeare's Hamlet, that lost earlier play became the missing link that would help us to understand Shakespeare's art by revealing how he had transformed the Ur Hamlet into his masterpiece. The term missing link was widely popularized after the discovery of Pithecanthropus erectus in 1891. And not only this term, but numerous other references to evolution pop up in discussions of the play around this time. The solution to all the problems of Hamlet, we are told, is to be found only in the study of the evolution of the play. In comments like these, Shakespeare's Hamlet becomes an evolved organism, a higher form than the Ur Hamlet and Q1 but nevertheless derived from them and therefore displaying vestigial traits that would remain inexplicable unless properly located in the descent of the play. And the key difference that critics now saw in Hamlet compared to the less evolved Q1 was the meditative character of Shakespeare's Prince. While the Ur Hamlet was a crude play, a primitive tale of lust, blood feuds, and revenge filled with blood and horror. Remember, this play doesn't exist, so these critics are just making up what they think is in it. <laughs> but this is what it must have been like. Um, Shakespeare's revision, we're told, purified the play and its main character of that taint of their barbaric birth. As one critic pithily summed it up, the old Hamlet does most of the deeds of the play, and Shakespeare's Hamlet thinks most of the thoughts. According to this evolutionary framework, Shakespeare's Hamlet surpasses the Ur Hamlet and Q1, just as the civilized surpasses the barbaric, the Renaissance surpasses the medieval, and the modern skeptical attitude towards religion surpasses an older blind faith. Hence, the more traditionally religious comments that Hamlet professes, the sentiments he professes in the Q1 version of To Be or Not To Be, were mirrored by his exemplary Christian death. Farewell, Horatio, heaven receive my soul, he says piously. Whereas the rest is silence, returns us to the puzzling unknowns of the famous version of the soliloquy. On this reading, the brilliance of Shakespeare's Hamlet lay not in its plot, which after all he had inherited, but rather in its philosophy. The point of view of a new age is expressed with cautious skepticism in to be or not to be, with a unique mixture of sober, rational, almost scientific thought. The agnostic skepticism of the soliloquy became a hallmark of scholarly criticism, distinguishing Shakespeare's work from the more pious Q1. Readers now had a new way to assimilate the uncomfortable fact brought home by Bunbury's discovery that Shakespeare's masterpiece was not an original work of art. Hamlet owes even less than usual to inventive construction of plot, but Shakespeare's supreme power of wholly transforming the spiritual complexion of a tale is nowhere so wonderfully seen. 
If the new view of Q1 as the missing link meant that Shakespeare's Hamlet was a bit less original, his genius could still be found in the spiritual complexion of the play, in the questioning philosophy of a new age. The new reading of conscience as consciousness rather than as the God-given moral guide perfectly captures this desire for a modern Shakespeare, a modern Hamlet, heralding the dawn of modernity in the Renaissance. This has been a very powerful reading, but as I hope I've shown, its power comes from its ability to resolve problems about Hamlet that could be seen only after Bunbury's discovery of Q1. It's a reading that tells us less about Shakespeare at the Globe Theater than it does about the meaning of Shakespeare in the 19th century. And this reading has in fact obscured a fundamental problem with Hamlet's line about conscience as it appears in the famous version of the soliloquy. Put simply, the line doesn't make much sense there. I think conscience is decidedly unlikely to carry any meaning other than the religious one. Yet, in its famous version, to be or not to be includes no religious language aside from this word, leaving conscience curiously unmoored. The word conscience appears seven other times in the familiar text, and in each case there's no doubt that it carries its usual religious meaning from Hamlet's desire to catch the conscience of the king to Laertes' admission that killing Hamlet is almost against my conscience. There's no warrant anywhere else in Hamlet, in other words, for reading conscience in any other way. Even more importantly, the idea that conscience makes us cowards is a Renaissance proverb that appears in numerous other texts. And in this proverbial usage too, conscience always has its familiar meaning. We're told that an ill conscience enfeebles us, makes very cowards of us. An evil conscience makes us dastards and cowards. The conscience, wherein remains the memory of former violence and injustice, makes men cowards and afraid to grapple with death. We're cowards, in other words, because sinners that we are, we fear God's judgment and damnation. So we don't want to put ourselves in situations where we might die. In the fully Christian vision of the soliloquy in Q1, the phrase conscience makes cowards of us all represents a perfect application of this proverb. Hamlet makes the traditional point that people with a bad conscience, people who are contemplating suicide, bear those evils we have out of the fear of evils that we know not of, the hellish torments awaiting the damned. But the familiar version of to be or not to be is difficult to reconcile with this tradition. Here we have no mention of eternal judgment, the basic precondition for the proverb in every other text in which it's used in the period. Without this Christian vision of the last judgment, the soliloquy lacks the foundation necessary to the meaning of conscience makes cowards. Precisely because the line therefore appears out of place by comparison with the fully Christian Q1, after the discovery of that text, Hamlet's conscience generated a large commentary tradition dedicated to explaining that its true meaning carried no religious significance at all. Before Bunbury's discovery though, readers had simply assumed that conscience makes cowards had its usual religious meaning. So how did those earlier readers reconcile this explicitly Christian proverb with the complete absence of Christian theology in to be or not to be? An intriguing clue emerges from the earliest evidence we have of someone actually reading the speech. The most remarkable surviving copy of the first folio is currently housed at Meisei University in Tokyo. Here we can see an early 17th century reader annotating the plays in detail. This reader made notes of key plot points. Here at the top of the first page, for instance, we see conditions of single combat between Hamlet and Fortinbras. But like many contemporary readers, he or she was more interested in extracting usable proverbs and beautiful passages from the text for transcription into a commonplace book. A commonplace book archived passages for later repurposing in the reader's own writing. Hence, we find the Meisei reader making generalized and abstract glosses like madness by love when Polonius diagnoses Hamlet, mercy blots away offense during Claudius's futile prayer, or dissuasion to a woman from marriage, the nunnery scene. These notes are the reader's first pass through the text. The glossed lines will next be transcribed into a commonplace book under appropriate headings. Since commonplacing was meant as a general aid to rhetoric, these notes therefore ignore the plot, disregarding that Polonius is completely wrong in his diagnosis of Hamlet's madness, and that Claudius is unable to find the mercy that might blot away his offense. 
The Mese reader's glossing of to be or not to be is entirely in the commonplace mode. For this near contemporary of Shakespeare, the speech was a rhetorical set piece filled with good, extractable lines. Not, as for most later critics, a turning point in the plot or the development of Hamlet's character. In the top margin of the page, he or she has noted that the speech is particularly rich in discussions of doubt what befalls after death and miseries and disgraces whereto we are subject. But one particular line stood out, the only line actually quoted, or nearly quoted, conscience makes us cowards. To this early reader interested in Proverbs, Hamlet's line about conscience was the centerpiece of the speech, no doubt because it was already proverbial. Unlike modern critics, the Mesa annotator makes no attempt at a holistic reading that can account for the speech as a coherent statement on conscience, the afterlife, or suicide. Indeed, he or she typically does not read holistically at all because commonplacing deliberately takes lines out of context. There's been a longstanding debate, for instance, about whether Polonius should be understood as a wise counselor or a buffoonish pedant. The Mese reader was struck by the profundity of Polonius' speeches of advice to Laertes and Ophelia, noting wise precepts of a father to a son going to travel in foreign countries, and a father's wise counsel to his daughter not to believe the promises and oaths of a young professed lover. But when Hamlet mocks Polonius and his plentiful lack of wit, the Mese reader glosses defects of old men. <clears throat> so the debate about whether Polonius is wise or foolish is simply irrelevant. His speeches are understood as instances of rhetoric rather than insights into a unified character. For the Mese reader, and I suspect for many others in the period, to be or not to be thus becomes a speech about that is able to be transcribed into a commonplace book under headings associated with doubt what befalls after death. And it's also a speech that includes the proverb, conscience makes us cowards. What it does not have to be is a speech in which this saying forms part of a single coherently logical statement. At one moment, Hamlet can voice a clearly non-Christian and skeptical perspective on the afterlife, doubt what befalls us after death. At another, he speaks a commonplace about conscience that requires the audience to maintain precisely the Christian viewpoint that the rest of the speech utterly denies. If we want a unified discussion of the question, or the point, we will find it only in Q1. Only there does the entire speech hang together. Only there does Hamlet's comment that conscience makes cowards participate in a seamless Christian analysis of death, judgment, and the afterlife. In other words, the relationship between the two versions of to be or not to be is precisely the opposite of how it has always been understood. Instead of being unconnected, unintelligible jargon, Q1 is the far more coherent version of the speech. In fact, Q1's powerfully coherent Christian message entrenched the now commonplace notion that the famous version was a cry of modernist existential anguish in which thinking itself, conscience, makes us unable to act in the world. But rather than being the true and original meaning of Hamlet's conscience, that idea emerged into the world only after Sir Henry Bunbury found this long lost copy of Q1 Hamlet in his closet. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. We have uh, time for questions. Our experience in this room is that if you shout your question out, you can be heard, but we'll make sure to repeat it if there is any doubt. Are there questions? Hi there. Go ahead. Stand. Yeah, it's actually been performed. Um, can you question? hear? Yeah. yeah, sorry, the question was, has the Q1 text been performed? And uh, it was performed occasionally even in the 19th century. Uh, then it kind of disappeared for a long stretch of time. And in, I would say in the last 10 years, it gets performed pretty regularly. Um, and in fact, tomorrow night, if you want to come back, <laughs> uh, not the entire play, but important moments in the play will be performed. I've seen it performed a couple times. Um, you can make a very good play out of it. It's, it feels coherent. It doesn't feel unintelligible. Some of the lines that are a little weird in Q1 or, or, or 
like the bit I showed you with four times repeating sort of the same line. Directors can always cut lines from Shakespeare's plays, they always do, and also in, when you're watching it in performance, some of that slips past you without you really noticing. So it works, it works very well on the stage. One of its big benefits is that it's only half as long. <laughs> so. This lady here. Um, in what context was it performed? Like, how would it have been marketed to a 19th century audience? Okay, the question is how, when it was performed in the 19th century, I mean, how, how was it performed? How was it marketed? Um, it was performed in an effort, as it's often been performed actually recently, in an effort to um, sort of redeem the play, to show that, no, this is not a totally garbled uh, shorthand, bad shorthand transcription. It was, it was mounted um, as an effort to show it was Shakespeare's original draft. And the idea being, if you could put on a good play, uh, therefore, it must be Shakespeare's original draft, not a terrible bootleg copy. And, and that has continued, actually, today. A lot of um, critics who, who still today want to argue that this is Shakespeare's rough draft say, but look, it works on stage, and therefore it, it can't just be a bad memory or something like that. I'm a little skeptical of that argument because, of course, good directors and good actors you know, can make almost anything work on stage. <laughs> right? um, so I don't know how much we can really prove about the origins of the text from that. A couple of months ago, The Atlantic published an article about Amelia Bassano as being a potential author of some of Shakespeare's works. Is there any evidence that she had any role in this, or what are your comments on her role with any of the Shakespeare works that she alluded to? Okay, so the question is about a theory that was recently proposed that um, a woman named um, Amelia Bassano or Amelia Lanyard is the true author of, of Shakespeare's, all of his works, I think the original argument. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, believe that argument at all. There's a lot of different candidates for who really wrote Shakespeare. Um, I think he did, but uh, <laughs> but um, but you know, what part of what I want to talk about in this talk is what does it mean to say that he, Shakespeare wrote the place of Shakespeare? We actually don't still totally know a lot about Shakespeare's authorship. We don't know in Romeo and Juliet whether Shakespeare wrote a rose by any other name would smell as sweet or whether he wrote a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. Both are perfectly plausible readings. Both appear in early texts of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, but we don't totally know what that meant. Uh, the other thing I would say is that other people did write some of Shakespeare. Um, not any of the people that have been proposed, but other professional dramatists helped to write some of Shakespeare's plays. And their work has often been, over the history of Shakespeare editing and criticism, erased. Um, but so if we're looking for other hands in Shakespeare, they're there. I just don't think that they're the people that generally have been proposed. Oh. Hi there, go ahead. Do we know anything about who were handling? by references or where would it be? So the only things we know about it are those two illusions that I put up on the screen. I can... Um, Repeat the question. Sorry. The, uh, sorry about that. And thanks for reminding me. The question is, what do we know? Do we know anything about this Ur Hamlet? Um, this is what people thought they knew about it, right? Um, people even wrote it, you know, tried to write it out. Um, <laughs> It's what we do when we have a lost Shakespeare. There's a, there's a lost Shakespeare play called Cardenio, almost certainly that Shakespeare uh, did co-write, uh, but we don't have it. And there have been two different um, people who have written it recently. Um, it's like we can't lose anything of Shakespeare. These are the, the, really all that we know about that play. <clears throat> we also have the record of a performance of Hamlet um, uh, in the early 1590s. So we, we have no record of Shakespeare even being in London in 1589, but we also don't know where he was. So as I say, the only things we know are um, maybe this line, the ghost, this is a, re a satirical reference to the ghost which cried so miserably at the theater like an oyster wife, that is a woman who sells oysters who are um, stereotypically imagined to have kind of shrieky voices who cried out Hamlet Revenge, is someone making fun of the play. Um, <clears throat> the other reference is also joking uh, and uh, attacking the author. Uh, 
uh, English authors who basically read a translation of Seneca, his Roman tragedies. They're too stupid to read it in Latin, so they have to read English Seneca. And you could just copy speeches from the English translation of Seneca, and it'll give you whole hamlets. I mean, it's a very bad pun, right? Whole hamlets, I mean handfuls of tragical speeches. So that's it. That's all we know. Um, you know, we generally have assumed this is not by Shakespeare, because Shakespeare was not in London at the time. But we don't actually know where he is. Possibly, this is the earliest thing he ever wrote, and it's his. Um, I tend to doubt that, uh, because we really have no any record of Shakespeare being in London before about 1593. Can I ask, Zach, if you're right that the to be or not to be speech in Q1 is so coherent and the version in the more familiar version is incoherent, mm -hmm. how do you account for the incoherence of this, the more familiar version? So I, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's incoherent, but it, what it is is a speech that's quite coherent and then has this line put in there that doesn't really make sense if we don't accept this alternate reading of consciousness. I think Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare was a writer who patched stuff together from what was already out there. And I think here he's writing a speech which is very unusual in some regards, highly original in some regards. And uh, to write a soliloquy like this, which doesn't do what a soliloquy does, is unusual. And the speech itself is, is quite radical and almost blasphemous in the way it approaches the afterlife, right? But then I think, you know, Shakespeare's writes, okay, I'm writing about death and suicide, and, and he remembers what's a very common proverb, which is conscience makes us cowards, right? And he's sort of trying to slip it into this speech that's about the inability to act, but not quite for the same reason. Proverbs are so powerfully important in Shakespeare's literary culture that I think the opportunity maybe was just too good to miss he to could, get that in He there. couldn't resist. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I am curious about, you said that the portrayal of Gertrude changed from Q1 to Q2. Mm -hmm. What happened with Ophelia? Was Ophelia mm -hmm. there? Okay. No, that's a really good question. So um, the question is about uh, Ophelia, right? So we I discussed a bit what happens to Gertrude in Q1. And um, so it's, it's quite uh, an important question to look at the other female character in the play, right? And this is another moment where I see a kind of pattern at work that suggests this can't be just random bad memory or bad stenography because so Gertrude, as I suggested, becomes a much more um, kind of uh, traditionally good mother. She constantly talks, she refers to herself as Shakespeare, as Hamlet's, that's a weird Oedipal moment. <laughs> she, refer, she refers to herself as Hamlet's mother, actually, repeatedly in places where she doesn't in the other, in the other text. And Ophelia is also, um, we might say, chastened, that is made more chaste in the Q1 version. So, for instance, um, <clears throat> there's an important moment where Ophelia recounts to her father how Hamlet came into her as... In the um, second quarto, she says she was uh, in her closet. And in the folio, she says she was in her chamber, which probably means a bedchamber. Both of these are very private spaces. And Hamlet comes in, and he's half undressed, and he's wild, and he's clearly, he, he presents the appearance, the stereotypical appearance of someone who's been driven mad by love. And you know, in, in either of those, the usual text, this raises some unsettling questions about how does Hamlet even get into those rooms? How does he know? Has he been there before? So some films, famously the Kenneth Branagh version, you know, includes a sex scene between them, right? Um, in the Q1, she says instead, as I was walking in the gallery, which is a public hallway in the castle, um, a totally you know, transformative word choice. And there are several other moments where she refers to herself as a maiden, that is a virgin uh, young woman. Uh, other, other characters refer to her that way. So I think, like Gertrude, Ophelia is, is, it's almost as if there's some anxiety that the female characters are not properly chased in the, in the other version, and they're being sort of tidied up. Now, that implies that this, I've already implied that the Q1 version came later. That's not necessarily the case. We could imagine it that, you know, there's this 
very traditional depiction of women, and Shakespeare says, that's boring. I'm going to do something more interesting. <laughs> One last question, I think. Hi there. Heidi. I want to ask you about Q5 instead of Q1. Mm -hmm. So as you will know, and some people here will know, um, there was a discovery in September of the handwriting in the first folio that, in fact, we now have Milton. And one of the things that Claire Horn determined that he's done is very carefully collated Q5, which comes out after the folio, um, with the first folio. And so I'm just curious what you make of that, mm -hmm. thinking not about Q1, but mm -hmm. Q5. Okay, so the question is about the recent um, recent claim that, that a copy of the first folio, which is in Philadelphia, at the um, Public Library of Philadelphia, and is heavily marked up. Um, and the, the discovery that these annotations appear to be in the handwriting of John Milton. So this, we know Milton read Shakespeare, loved Shakespeare, wrote, wrote a poem about Shakespeare. He obviously owned a copy of the first folio, uh, and this appears to be that copy. And um, one of the scholars who uh, has worked on that copy, um, Claire Bourne, she worked on it while she was at Penn in Philadelphia, um, was able to determine what a copy of Hamlet the annotator had at, beside the folio as he was going through and correcting words in the folio with what he thought were the proper readings of those lines. And it's a later quarto, uh, the fifth quarto of Hamlet, which comes out after the publication of the first folio. Um, so this is interesting, I think, for a couple of reasons that relate to, to what I've talked about here. Because the modern view of, again, getting back to the question of what do we know about Shakespeare the author? The modern view of how do we determine what the text of a play should be? What should, the te what should we print in an edition of Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet or King Lear? These plays where they, there are multiple options. Uh, the modern version is we want to get as far back as we can as close to the moment, whatever printed text of the play we can determine is closest to Shakespeare's hand, closest to the manuscript he wrote. That's what we want to go for. That, that uh, kind of encodes a whole lot of uh, theory, modern theory, about what a text is. That is, we like authorial text. We tend to think that a literary creation emerges from the author. Even in a, the case of drama, where we know there's a lot of collaboration happening. Nonetheless, we tend to focus on the playwright. There are other ways to imagine, obviously, that, right? Uh, only very recently have we imagined something like television programs as coming from a, a writer, right? We generally thought about them. Well, what, what network is it on? Who's the star actor? Uh, those kind of things. So the interesting thing about this copy of the first folio, if, if the annotator is using a later quarto, he's doing so because he has sort of the opposite view of authorship. That is, he wants to correct the folio by the most recently printed text of the play, not the earliest, because his view is that there's a kind of progressive improvement of the text over time. And it doesn't matter if the author is the one doing it. Right? There's <laughs> editors, there's other people involved, and over time, we can make this text better by correcting errors. So he wants to use the latest, the, the new and improved version of the text. That's something that no modern editor of Shakespeare would ever do. Right? If you did that, your proposal for the edition would be immediately rejected right, by the press. Um, so you know, it's an interesting way into this, to the larger question of what is a play? Like, Where does the play come from? Is it the author's play? Is it the actor's play? Is it, in this case, kind of the culture's play to work on over time and improve, even if that has nothing to do with the writer himself? Just to reassure you, the copy of the first folio to which Zach refers was not originally owned by Henry Huntington and deaccessioned by him, just in case you were worrying yeah, about that. He, he didn't sell it. Um, we're going to call it a day there. Uh, please join me in thanking Zach Lesser for a tour of the force. Thank you.
So thank you all for coming. Thank you for your consistent support of our programs. Coffee and cookies are served outside. And if you'd like to see the bad or better quarto performed, please come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>